just like in a music band, you know. Hey, everybody in the crowd, just smile. I'm and gonna put some paint over. Yeah. Right. Okay. Hovel, I mind the, the screen. Right. So hi. I'm Tommy. I think I know everybody today, except for one, two, three, four, five people. But everybody else is regular, so that's quite cool. Uh, not so many people today, that's quite nice, so we're going to have a nice informal conversation. You can be chatty today, all right? just say whatever you want to say. We're going to have a, an experiment today. All right? First of all, let me say the legal stuff that I need to say. So Dark Music Talk is a thing that's happening every month and we gather here so we can talk about stuff related to music with a person that knows stuff and people that want to learn stuff. Right, so this is this is it. Very simple. It's happening every month. Today we're going to talk about how you write, how you put the words sexy, so other people can read what you're writing and want to do what you want them to do. Right? Obviously, the, the, the title was not so sexy because I didn't see many people coming. Well, that's another story. So that, that's pretty right. We got we got a person today, Jack, that knows hello stuff. And he's being a copywriter, he's been writing texts and ads and stuff for Smirnoff, Unilever, and, and The Guardian and other, the Guardian. In other places. Alright, so I'm Tommy, musician, just like you. I think you know that already. Uh, so, today, it's going to be an experiment. I'm going to live blog the whole thing. Alright, so, wish me good luck. This is why I'm saying be chatty. Whatever you want to say, write it on Twitter and use that one. So I'm going to be checking out who's saying what. I'm going to be retweeting it. I'm going to be, I'm going to be putting it on the live blogging stream so we can have a timeline of the conversation. All right. So let's just make it creative. It's going to be an experiment. If if it works next time, we're going to do it again. All right. So let, I don't like talking too much. So let's let's start. <laughs> Okay, so um, just so you know, uh, this is not about me talking, it's about you guys. So if there's anything you want to interrupt me about, please do. I want that to happen. Um, I also had some notes, but I can't see them, so I might not say everything I intended to, but this will be fine. Hello, humans. Also, I'm going to have lots of pictures of dogs. This is the theme. I'm going to break the text up a bit. So the aims of this talk are the following. I want to help you get a greater exposure and make more of an income from your music by giving you a bunch of different ideas that you can use separately or together. Obviously, not all of them are going to work for you, so take the ones that work and discard the rest. Um, and I want to also give you an introduction to a rather not straightforward world of copywriting that I work from, so that when we have the discussion later on, hopefully you guys will have questions that I can answer. Again, it's about the questions and me helping you. It's not about me just talking. Um, also, I want to help you give these, use these ideas in your music business as well, so help you improve your communication, your writing, that kind of stuff. Uh, some insights as well, because I'd imagine a lot of you guys deal with the media. I sometimes work as a music writer, so I want to give you a perspective from that side of the fence. And I want to have lots of pictures of dogs. So why should you care about anything I say? Well, you don't have to, but I am a professional copywriter and a freelance journalist, hence the music stuff. Unprofessional internet marketer, I'm not very good at that. Unprofessional sound designer and composer, so I'm also a musician, um, so I know what you guys do, uh, I think. So I've been on both sides of the fence. I want to be a film composer, but I'm currently chat writing dubstep and adverts, and I have no achievements. So it's not about me, it's about you and giving you the best info I can, just to reiterate that. So please interrupt me if you have anything at all you want to ask. Um, I'll be going as fast as possible, so this is a metaphor for me talking really, really quickly. So why would you care about copywriting? Well, good copywriting is about really understanding your product, which is essentially you as musicians, uh, and your music. So it's also about understanding your value proposition, i.e. what you offer, uh, why you exist in the context of the marketplace. So, you know, th what your music is and why it's different from other music. Helping you know yourself better. Music and words are both are about c communication. Um, so, what you apply to your music or from your writing can carry over from one to the other. And caring is good. Uh, your fans, they want to connect with you, essentially. That's what most 
I guess, relationships are about. Uh, music helps you build empathic bridges, you know, the idea of empathy, feeling another person's feelings. And we could all work on our empathy skills. And a way to do that is by essentially communicating, bringing it back to writing. Um, another thing I'll talk a little bit about is a bit the positioning. So the more you understand about your offering as a, well, in the context of the marketplace, the better you do commercially. And it's obvious and it's worth a mention, though. Copywriting is a complement to, not a substitute for your music. So your music speaks for itself, but the way you present it with words can help, basically. Uh, so we're all in this, what people are calling an attention age, and everyone's talking. You know, we're all on live blogging and Twitter, and we're all saying things to each other. So your communication style, like the better you get, even if it's just a little bit, carries over. Because every day, I would imagine most of you are talking to people, you're either on Facebook or you're on Twitter or something. So like 1% improvement on how you do that, that will compound over time. Um, as Ludwig Wittgenstein, Wittgenstein, I don't know how you say his name, said, the limits of my language are the limits of my world. And there is a picture of a dog. Um, so you can describe good copywriting as the right message, so your brand, your medium of communication, how you present yourself, going to the right people, so your right listener demographic, and the people who make the financial decisions, i.e. the people who will buy your product or services at the right time. So when they have money uh, available to see you play, they're not distracted by other media like Game of Thrones or Breaking Bad. And that equals great success, which is nice. So what can you do with words? Well, you can persuade people. You can get them to buy stuff or do things that moves along your grand plan. I'm assuming you'll have some vision in where you're taking your music and your arts businesses. You can build empathy and connection with your listeners. So you can get new people to like you, or the people who like you, you can get them to like you even more. And you can clearly communicate what you're doing, which is important, and you can tell people what they need to do to help you get to where you want to go. Um, you can also be a bit more interesting in the way you communicate. You know, you, you have your own voice. The better you communicate, the more easily people can see that. Um, it's basically a unique communicational style. Um, you can also start conversations on uh, social media, dialogues. This is something that Tommy seems to be very good at. Um, and you can also, by asking people, you can find out what's working and what's not working for your fans and what I'm going to call allies, who are, say, business partners. So in this instance, like an ally for me would be Tommy. Me and him are sort of doing this together. But I'm sure you all work with people as well. So it's a bit like doing market research. And you can also recognize and reward your fans and people who are working with you. So here are some fundamentals of copywriting, which hopefully will put everything in context. Um, you want to know what problem your customer is facing or what emotional experience they want your music to guide them through. So the first thing to consider is your fan. Like, who does your music appeal to? Where do you find them? How do they experience your music? It's, you know, it's like these important questions that you start with. Um, so for example, with how, uh, occasions suited to Marilyn Manson might not be one suited where classical music works. And that's an important thing to consider. You know, what context is your music being listened to? And thinking, I guess, a bit more mercenarily, what aside from music do your people, your fans, want to spend uh, money on? Um, that's a joke about being a huge metal fan. You've probably seen it. Um, a fundamental is difference. So. What makes you different, essentially? Why are you not the same as everyone else who's in your marketplace? So the music you create, what makes it different? Is that, you know, do you have a sound specifically different? You know, it, this is an incredibly hard question for me to just put out there because everyone is so very, well, different. But you have to know what it is that you do differently and be able to play upon that. Um, you know, what brand, image, and design do you possess? Have you thought about like how you look, how you design your album covers, how you present yourself? You want to be memorable in that area. And these differences are areas to exploit and emphasize. So you know you need to make sure that you are noticeable. People remember you for what you are. It's the same reason why, you know, like cookie cutter pop bands, they come and go, you know, the one hit wonders, but no one really remembers them. Whereas those who really kind of blaze the trail in the music industry usually 
seen as true artists and they're noticed for doing something different. They innovated, you know? So you've got to look like you're innovating. You've got to show people you're doing that. Two kinds of people in the world, you and everyone else. So maybe it's uh, about being different enough to be recognizable, but not so different that people can't recognize you, or what people in the business world call differentiation. So here's some quick tips for your copywriting, or for your communication, if you're doing when you're communicating with people. Um, when you're writing, you want to write specifically to one person, not to your fans. So you're not speaking to a group of people. You're speaking to someone in your mind who is your ideal fan, an archetype. Um, you know, someone you're on really good terms with. Imagine that you like, for me, I see it best to imagine you're in a social space with them and you're just telling them a story face to face about what you do. Um, write as yourself, don't put on a persona. I mean, that's, that's not a hard and fast rule, some people can do, but generally, people pick up on your authenticity when you are speaking as yourself. Um, ask open questions. So don't be like, you know, don't ask a question where someone can say yes or no. But do start a debate, so, you know, encourage people to put their opinions in. Because um, you know, we can all basically, like, the more you allow people to converse with you, I mean, this is old hat by now, but it's not about just telling people stuff. It's about getting them to engage with you. And uh, never give all the game away. A lot of things that people do is they try and summarize everything in the text that they're writing. But, you know, what you can do is just have, say, click this link for more information. Keep it short and snappy allow people to learn more as they go along. Um, another thing to do is ask yourself regularly, so what? Like, what's in it for your reader? Why should they care? You know, it's very easy to be like, I've got this great idea, off I go, and then you realize basically you're ranting. Uh, Jeff, one, one quick question. So, uh, we're gonna give all the presentation to the people. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So just keep that in mind. If you keep writing notes and you don't pay attention, I think it's better to pay attention and we have the. Yeah, that's it. I mean, totally. Like this, this will be available later on in video form. I'll probably give you the PowerPoint if you want to put that up or something. So you don't need to be too note takey. Um, so yeah, where was I? So regardless of what you're communicating, you're always, 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 always selling your reader on reading the next sentence. We've all got like information or ADHD now. Like seriously, there's so much text out there that most people skim everything. I mean, I skim everything and I'm supposed to be a writer. So what you're doing is you're trying to just remember you want, if you're writing something, you're selling people on reading the next line, not just zooming through it. Um, you can end all of your communications, you don't have to, but I recommend it, with a clear call to action. So when you're writing something, think, what do you want people to do? You're not just like putting words out there because, hey, it's fun, even though it might be. Maybe you want them to click a link, to like a page, to share something. Tell them that. You know, don't just imagine. People, people aren't just going to go from inference. You know, if you want them to do something, tell them. Um, CTA, in other words, that's the acronym for call to action. So if you want someone to click through to your YouTube video, ask at the end of the message. Um, and this action is why, essentially, you're communicating with people. That's the goal. That's what copywriting is all about. You're, you have a reason. You want people to do something, and the text will allow them to do that. Um, not all of your messages are obviously going to be written with the goal of getting people to do stuff. Sometimes you'll just be taking pictures of your dinner or whatever. You know, we all do frivolous tweeting and stuff. But think about it. A lot of the stuff you do want to be driving some sort of action that moves you along towards what you're trying to achieve. Uh, have any of you guys seen Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross? Yeah. Some of you have. Always be closing. ABC. Watch it, it's good. Um, so yeah, here's three big ideas that aren't really big. Um, we're going to talk about marketing, basically. So positioning. I mentioned this a bit before. It's uh, do you know who you are and where you are in relation to your competition and the musical marketplace? So do you know what you're selling and who's buying? And if you don't, then find out. Um, you can find out by basically asking you yourself the following questions and getting clear on what the product is, who it appeals to, where it is, so who you're competing with and why it's great and different, and why, you, why should people want to listen to you or download your tracks and stuff. Um, you can do that by having a personal brand. You've probably all heard of the idea of that before. Um, this is something that the commercial music industry takes to ridiculous extremes, but you can do that by thinking about your personal look and your graphic design, 
you know, is that consistent? I'm not a stylist, so I can't tell you if your look works for your target audience, but there are people out there who can. Your tone of voice, does it fit with your identity? So are you that guy who's uh, always angry about something? Are you like a kind of a protest musician? Or are you a kind of a more laid back sort of guy who's just, you know, not really too, too angry about anything and just enjoys making music? We all have to have a way, a tone of voice that people can associate with us that's consistent. And hopefully, if you're being yourself, that's coming out naturally anyway. So Madonna, as an example, she has reinvented herself over and over again. And I'm not a huge fan, and I don't know her very well. But it seems to have worked. I mean, would you guys say that's worked for her? Yeah? No? I don't know. You tell me. Like, but she seems to be on top of the charts and has been there for a while. And she's had so many different looks. So maybe partly that's down to her fame and having a core fan base, but maybe a lot of that is a smart targeting of a new audience, you know, as a new generation gets into music, she knows exactly what they'll be interested in, and she does it. So how do you understand, well, how do you have a, a good self-description? You want to essentially connect with the real fans, and they buy into you wholesale, not just the music you create. You know, it's a lifestyle thing, generally. Like, true fans are people who are fanatical about an artist, so it's everything your personal style, your personality, your lifestyle, you know, not just your music. Um, so just give them more to connect with. How are you communicating and connecting with them at current? Can you do better? I've got an exercise that will be available, essentially, to help you get a bit clear. I haven't really got time to go through it now. Um, but it can help you in crafting a personal brand if you haven't already. And we're learning, like the learning dog. This is super focused. So, what is traumatic word power? That's something I just came up with on the PowerPoint for a laugh. Um, I think it comes down to three points. It's powerful headlines, powerful words, and a powerful narrative structure. You want people, ideally, to be reading your posts and to look like the two stock photos below. So idea number one is to use ballsy headlines. Like headlines are probably the most important thing in your writing, because that's where you get people's attention. Um, and pretty much everything you set, you kind of you communicate with in text, it's going to have a headline. Um, don't reinvent the wheel, basically. There are headlines that work already. You know, people have been writing them for 150 years. Um, we have these things called swipe files, which are essentially ideas that work in headline form. And uh, I've got one for you guys at the end. On average, apparently, according to Copyblogger, 8 out of 10 people will read the headline, but only 2 out of 10 will read the rest. So think about how important it is to get people's attention in that line. There's one or two lines. Very important. So as I mentioned, swipe files. I will give you one at the end. Basically, it's headlines I stole from people who stole from people who stole from people. Um, you know, it's, it's fundamental principles, and it works. Uh, like that Steve Jobs quote, which isn't, I don't think, really a Steve Jobs quote. Uh, I think it was a Picasso quote. It says, good artists copy great artists still. Um, and it's also a good headline as well. It's snappy, so it's relevant. So what is a good headline? Well, it grabs attention from line one, and it leads from there. So it informs your reader concisely. It doesn't rant and waste people's attention, because as I said, people don't have any attention anymore. This is the internet. Um, you're always selling people on reading the rest of your text. So you're directing a reader to do something. It uses powerful, timeless words, which I've got a list of, and I will provide in the notes at the end. You know, so you can substitute out words that you're using already that might not be quite so emotionally powerful with ones that are proven to, to kind of get people to do stuff, like click things. Um, and yeah, it uses a, a timeless structure, which you can take from the swipe file. So your headline formula, if any of you are into that kind of thing, can be, I mean, there's a number of different ones, but one that I've seen that works quite well was written in an article by a guy called Jeff Goins, which is a number or a trigger word plus an adjective plus a keyword plus a promise. So I just put random stuff into it, and I got 13 fantastic ways to overeat sweet potatoes and still feel great about yourself. And that, obviously, that's stupid, but that's a headline. You know, that's the format, that's the structure of a headline, and probably some people will click that just because it works, even if it makes no sense. So bad headline, what is a bad headline? Well, it basically doesn't do any of those things. So I got a few pictures of stupid headlines, like army vehicle disappears. That's not very helpful. This one actually might be quite good on the grounds that it's funny. Alton attorney accidentally sues himself. 
uh, one at the bottom, ultra-redundant, woman found dead in Thornton was killed. <laughs> okay. yeah, and that was actually a headline. Someone wrote that, so I'd imagine someone got fired for that. Um, yeah, don't write like that. People don't like that. That's a wall of text. I don't like that, and I'm supposed to be a writer. Uh, instead, do things with paragraphs. Uh, formatting. You know, you need variety, essentially. Don't be afraid to, if your medium allows you to use bullet points or underlining or italics. You know, just make the text look more interesting. People, people like variety. Um, here's some pictures of Terry Crews shouting. So power, what are the power of words? It's, the power of words is really um, what feelings you're tapping into. Uh, words are just like, if you use them properly, they're a way to get people to feel certain things. You know, and there's so many different things that people can feel. Uh, some, people, some copywriters want to create a feeling of fear. I don't think that's ethical. That's not how I write. But you know, it's like uh, there's kind of, I guess, Daily Mail type headlines where it's a terrifying thing. Most recent sort of stuff, those spiders. I can't remember the names of them. But you know, the same sort of thing, like is creating a feeling of fear that gets people hooked on this idea, and they need, to, they need to find out about it. Urgency is another one. Um, you know, so it's like maybe this, you have a deal or something, or you have a gig, and it's expiring. You know, you're doing it tomorrow. So you urgently want people to sign up you know, to buy tickets or whatever. Another thing, I can't really think of it in a musical context, but reassurance. You know, sometimes you want to, I guess, uh, your audience to feel reassured that listening to you is a good idea. You know, your music is intelligent, and by listening to you, they feel more intelligent. Exclusivity is something that is used quite a lot. Um, you know, like people like to be part of a club. So can you be exclusive in your offering? Uh, can you make them feel like they're part of a, a privileged few people? I guess that's um, a big driver behind the hipsters. You know, like they feel like, OK, this is my band. Only me and a small group of people know about this. And there's, there's so many other things you can tap into. But the most powerful word you can ever use, and I want to emphasize this, is you. So you. You're always speaking to your reader, whoever they are, and they like the sound of their name. So a lot of it is at your discretion. There's no like kind of list of words that are the best words ever. But as I mentioned before, and I didn't mention before, there's, um, there are certain lists online where you can see substitutions of weak words for strong words. And one of those will be available. And there is a picture of Terry Crews showing. Um, I don't know if you, have you guys heard of the phrase weasel words? Have you heard of that? Some of you are smiling. OK. Linguistic cowardice, I call weasel words. Weasel words are the stuff that makes people hate advertisers, because it's basically lying, but not quite lying, almost lying. It's like it's when you're not being specific enough, you're just being slightly unspecific. Um, using them makes you sound like a slimy advert or a crap Wikipedia article that doesn't really inform you of anything. So an example being up to 50% off. What does that mean? Well, anything from 0 to 50% is up to 50%. So basically, you're not really giving much information. Things like people say that. What people? Or everybody knows. Do they really? These things are not. They're not, you know, this is just something that it's fluff, basically. It's bad use of words. Bad. Um, Another thing to do is to use narrative structure and rhetoric. So basically, humans love stories. That's like we're hard-coded into our DNA or something. People have been telling stories since humans have been speaking. Um, so tell them stories about stuff. Bridge your paragraphs so that the copy flows. So for example, and speaking of sweet potatoes as a bridge between one paragraph and the next. So it doesn't look like you're writing a, a series of separate pieces. Uh, you can start sentences with questions that you answer. Or you can use words and phrases like so, or single line paragraphs for emphasis. Again, this is all a bit too theatrical, theatrical, theoretical. So the point is to make it just sound like you're talking to someone and you're mixing it up a bit. And don't be too abstract. People can't connect with that. So talk like you would talk. Write like you would talk. Use less words. I don't really know who Louise Brooks is, but she said writing is 1% inspiration and 99% elimination. And for someone who rants a lot, i.e. me, I think that's very true. So here's a bit that maybe you're most interested in, is how to connect, hopefully, connect with journalists and tastemakers better. Because there's certain things that artists do that piss people off, and you don't want to keep pissing people off. Um, you want to be seen as someone who is a useful resource for the person who writes about music, someone who 
I guess, you know, you want to be someone who's written about, not just an annoyance. So, the media wants to get journalism. The word journalism is a combination of churning and journalism. It's sad, but it's true. Like, they want stories that have written themselves. So, if you have something, like a press release, and we'll talk about that later on, um, that's really kind of like available for the writer to use with minimal effort, that's great. Writes cleared images. You know, if you want an article to run with pictures of you playing live and stuff, make sure, tell them that the images are rights cleared and they can use them and there's not going to be anyone suing them later down the line. Have a story that's not boring, which is actually harder than it sounds. You need a hook. So ask yourself, what, what's the reason? Why is it interesting? What's, what's gonna, what are they going to grab onto? What's the one point? You know, if you had to summarize it in a sentence, what's the one thing that's interesting about your story? Um, another thing that people like is the lowest common denominator, just because people click on things with cats, celebrities, and boobs. So pitch the right people. Don't just kind of, like, there are ways to get, I don't know if you guys are using uh, media lists or PRs or you're in PR or whatever, but there are a couple of places where you can get really good lists of people and they're updated and it's people who are relevant. So you want to talk to someone who writes about jazz music in London, Gorkana is going to have that. This is very local. So it's it can not be. Just in uh, no, no, this is all, I mean, this is international stuff, but um, there will be, say, if you wanted someone just in London, they'd have people, they'd have contacts specifically. Yeah, okay, I want a magazine based in Greenwich and want the guy who writes Yeah, most likely. Most likely. Um, exclusivity, which is one of those things that people like. It's a bit hard to do that unless you're uh, really, really famous, but maybe you can. The idea is that you know you're, you give an exclusive interview to a magazine or something. Friendly relationships. This is probably one of the most important things, is just be a nice person. Be someone that deals, he's not just pitching people and pushing products and releases, but actually like speaks to journalists and is like, oh, how can I help you? And it's, it's easy to be nice. Just ask people what, what they need. Help a reporter out. Um, some things that uh, really, really work, speaking from personal experience, is uh, a story that's pitched uniquely to me. And it tells me why I was chosen. So that's like almost, I guess, 50%. No, I wouldn't say it's that high. But like that, that really ups the odds that I'm going to think about running something. Because I think, well, this is relevant to me. And it's just, I guess, flattery will get you almost everywhere. But the relevance thing is the main point. Um, ask me what I'm working on and see if you can help. Uh, basically, like, I think the, the journalistic mindset is I hate everyone who wants to pitch me. I like everyone who wants to help me. That's a really stupid, simple simplification, a heuristic, but it's true. So just think of being helpful. Um, here's how to use Twitter. There's like an example of someone who tweeted me Utopia Music. I don't know this person, but um, they started a conversation. They said some, like, it's, it's hard to describe how they wrote, but it's quite snappy. Um, basically, it was funny. I spoke to the people at the festival who were organizing the musical event, and I'm not sure if anything came of it, but if I could have run a story about that, I would have, because I like the person, and it was pretty relevant. And it started a conversation, too. And then I talk about what the music media doesn't want to get. Um, don't just tweet at people with links to your... I mean, I'm, I'm imagining you guys aren't doing this, but I just want to go over it just to make sure. Um, don't just tweet at people with links to your songs. Um, you know, like, who are you? At least introduce yourself to people. Make them... You need to be recognizable before you're just putting out information. Um, don't just email people what we would call a blind press release without some form of contact first, introducing who you are and why, why you're relevant and why the content's relevant. Otherwise, you're just, just spamming people. And if you've done that already, it's okay, but you can... Now go back and establish your relationship with that reporter or journalist beforehand, which is a matter of just speaking to them. Um, don't email people from mail mergers. It's a really bad faux pas. I've been described, I've been emailed as journalist Orton. That's not my name. I just think it's kind of stupid. Um, people, you do that too much. Eventually, people will click spam once, and then from then on, Google Mail will just keep sending your communications to the junk mail filter and yeah, you're not going to get anything from that journalist. And don't be a dick on social media. Like, for example, this guy. Don't know who he was. Um, but yeah, he just tweeted me out of the blue. Retweet, retweet, and then like a YouTube link. And I'm like, 
immediately in my mind I was thinking, I'm not going to retweet this, you can't make me, I don't know who you are. And people do that and don't do that. Um, basically, a really quick talk about press releases here. They're fantastic if they're compelling, so they're written for reader, reader convenience, not the Pulitzer Prize. So you're not trying to write the best thing in the world, you're just trying to write something that interests the journalist. The reason for contact is clear, um, and the content appears to the journalist and his and her relationship with you, so the journalist knows why you're sending it to them, and send to the right people. There's no point sending a press release if you're trying to get musical coverage and you're sending it to someone who writes about food. So spam indiscriminately at your peril. And I've got a template to good press releases at the end of this that will be available to you. But the idea is, have any of you seen the inverted pyramid before? No? You have? OK. Um, the inverted pyramid is just like, basically, when you're writing stuff for people, you want, like, I guess, 40% of your effort is on the headline and the subheadline. You want to grab people's attention. And it gradually decreases in importance down to the bottom. So you want to get people at the top. You want the main the stuff that people are going to read. You want to get that right up front. You don't want to hide that for the end. And then, essentially, it, it decreases importance as you go down. So I'm going to shut up soon. Here is the summary. Music and words are both forms of communication that build empathy with your audience and your listeners. Um, Empathy is good because it allows people to feel the emotions that they're after. Like uh, one of the kind of the theories in marketing is that everything can be reduced as a, a means to enable good feelings. Um, so some songs will excite you, some songs will relax you, but you'll have a song for every kind of good feeling that you want. Um, and good copywriting helps you better understand your musical commercial offering, who wants it, how to package it so that they best get it. So it just helps you sort of see where you are and who wants what you've got. And it helps you build empathy. Uh, find out who's listening and speak directly to them. And that's serious business. So I have some ideas for next steps if you want to take something from this talk. Um, I've got like a five word self-description test I mentioned earlier that will help you see your personal brand. It's something you should best do when you're in a good frame of mind. So if you hate yourself right now, not a good time to uh, see what kind of musical brand you have. Uh, take a look over your biography and written marketing materials now knowing what you know, provided anything I said was relevant, if it was. Um, I've got some recommended resources which you're welcome to check out. Um, ask me stuff here if you want. Tweet me later on or email me later on if you want, that's fine. Um, and I'm very happy to provide any help I can. Tell me what I did wrong and what I did good, because feedback helps me improve. and. We're all hopefully improving in something. I think that's it. Oh yeah, so that's that's like a list of stuff that I'll have available. Uh, I think I'm going to give this to Tommy, but you can email me directly, and I'll give that to you. And it's like the swipe file, the press release template, uh, CO writing checklist, short lists of where you can find music writers and journos and bloggers, and good reading about writing better. Um, so do something, but keep it simple. And consider that quote by Warren Buffett, who's a very rich, successful man. He says he doesn't look uh, for seven-foot bars to jump over. He looks for uh, one-foot bars to step over. And I think that's the best thing to remember when you've had a bunch of information thrown at you. Don't just try and take it all in. Just pick one thing that maybe appeals to you and experiment with that. And that's everything, I think. So now, if you have questions, I would love to help. Or if you want to talk. Hmm? My email address, um, it's, I'll, I'll, write it out. I'll give it to everyone at the end, but it's basically my name at googlemail.com. deliberately say something shocking in there, or do you think it doesn't have to be shocking, it just has to be something unique? Do, you know, have you seen examples of them just claiming something? Yeah, yeah, I mean, there is a lot. There's a thing where sometimes people think uh, just being shocking is enough, but that doesn't really work because shocking's been done in so many different ways. Like, you know, I guess it was shocking in the 70s. Like, people like, I mentioned him earlier, but like, I guess Marilyn Manson and stuff have taken that, you know, that just let's shock people and pushed it as far as it's going to go. So, yeah, you want to be interesting. You can be shocking, it can work, but there's no guarantee anyone's going to care. They'll be like, oh, because we live in such a fucking... Pardon me. We live in such a violent world now. You know, we've got all this media. You know, the films. We're, we're all quite used to very shocking things. So you have to be particularly horrendous if you want to get people. 
on shock value, which I don't recommend at all. Yes, this is what I want to ask as well. Uh, so we're, we're artists, right? So we're supposed to communicate mm. our feelings, but it's it's really there's a lot of pressure when people need to read the headline mm. and, and click it so they can read the rest, mm. right? But you don't want to be very salesy if you want to achieve something, yeah. and you don't want to be unoriginal. Yeah. You still want to express your feelings <coughs> yeah. because you're an artist, you're not a marketer. Yeah. And you don't want to sound like one. Yes. So I don't know yourself, being a, an artist as well. Mm -hmm. How do you how do you find this sweet spot between being salesy and, and marketing a message, but also being authentic and, and being an artist? Well, like as an artist, I suck. Like, I mean, I have not done very well, <laughs> so I, I can't really talk to you uh, in that regard. Like, um, <coughs> I find it's for me, it's been a matter of my kind of personal brand as an artist is just irreverence. Um, so if I try to get people's attention, I'll just say something kind of silly. Um, and that's kind of work for me, but not so much. That's the kind of question that I'd put to <coughs> someone really who's like a, a really successful independent artist. But I do, I do think you're right. It's, um, the main problem is not to get so good at this stuff that it looks like you're a marketer instead of a musician, because I think people can pick up on that. There is a kind of a middle ground between it. So you want to take some of these ideas and apply them, but you don't want to apply them so well that it looks too slick. Because you know people can tell stuff that looks too slick, but again, it's just trial and error. I think the way around that would be: you book a marketer, you stay the artist. Yeah, I mean, there are people who get others to do their PR for them, and it works, you know. Um, but that will cost you. There are, you know, like a PR. Getting a PR is not cheap, as far as I'm aware. Yeah. But it works. Often works quite well. So if that's something you want to do, I'd say give that a go. Personally, I want to do things myself. Yeah. yeah. So, so this is a, this, here's another <coughs> question. So from your experience, when somebody receives an email by a, an agent, a booking agent, a PR person, yeah. and when they receive an email by the artist themselves, w what is the best thing? What are the things? Uh, yeah, having um, this is a, it's a good, good question, good point. I should have mentioned that. But it does, um, one of the oldest tricks in the book is like to get your sister or your mum or your grand to be your agent. Because it creates that, you know, that kind of, uh, it, it looks more professional. People aren't generally going to Google whoever's contacting you and be like, oh, is this person an actual legit agent or not? They're going to be like, oh, this person's got an agent. They're going to just think, oh, they're higher up than they are. So, but yeah. If they Google your sister, find out. The, yeah, that's it. I mean, that can happen. So that can backfire. That's the thing. It's, it depends. It's risk reward. Like most, I think, journalists would be too lazy to, to like Google um, specifically around your sister, like to make sure, oh, is this person actually an agent? And even if they did, they might not be, that might not be too much of a thing that bothers them. Um, but like if you've got, say, someone with their own email address, sorry, their own domain name, uh, that's another way. So for example, your sister had a website called like bandmarketing.com or something. That would look more authoritative than your sister just emailing from her Hotmail account. You know, so it's all about perception. <laughs> if that makes sense. But yeah, it does work. If someone, you know, if you get contacted by a PR or a, um, someone who's acting as an agent, it does come across as the artist is bigger. Though on the flip side of that, you do think when an artist contacts you directly, you think that's cool because um, they're actually reaching out and they're, they're talking to me directly. So it works either way, I think. Anything else? So I don't just try to process the whole information because for me, this is quite, quite difficult to understand. I mean, to put it in action, you know, in the great way. Yeah, yeah. So just trying to, to think, like, what is, what is better? Is it better to sacrifice your authenticity, or is it, is it good to follow and, and achieve your purpose, like, effectiveness? Well, I think... For, for me, this is the question, this is the main question about copywriting. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, for me, it's, it's not about sacrificing your authenticity. I think good copywriting is, one of the fundamentals of it is that you're being authentic. Because people who aren't, you know, like a bad actor, for example, you can tell a bad actor because they're the unauthentic one. Someone who's in a film and is not part of the, the, the drama sticks out. They're, they're not being authentic in relation to that. They're being they're mismatched. Like good copywriting, you're, you're talking as yourself. You know, no one knows your music, hopefully, better than you do. So as long as you can give across, you can communicate that passion. You know, there's that old saying, you can't sell what you're not sold on. You can't really be authentic without 
being true to who you are. I guess there are some people who have personas and they build up elaborate identities, but I've never really known anyone who's gone so far, you know, like so far with this kind of theatrical character that they can maintain all this time without changing who they are fundamentally, if that makes sense. You know, just be yourself, essentially. Talk as yourself. Madonna have been reinventing themselves a little yeah, bit. Yeah, yeah. Because they uh, cannot keep the same persona all the time. Well, I don't know. I mean, I think that uh, it's not just a matter of like it's it's like say this is David Bowie and this is his persona. I think he merges with his persona when he does it. Like method acting, you know, the idea of method acting where you essentially you absorb a character and you become that character for the method acting. You heard of that? It's it's a style of acting in which a uh, Robert De Niro, as an example, he will study a character that he's he's playing and he will become that character for the duration of the film. That's him. You know, he stays in, stays in character, as they say. Um, but you shouldn't need to do that if you're just being yourself. You are in character as you, and you're communicating as you, if that makes sense. Yeah, I just want to like, I just want to like reiterate that essentially. Good copywriting is, it's honest. Like, you know, it's got a bad name because there's so many people trying to sell you like weight loss products and get ripped in three seconds and all that nonsense. But it's all lies. That's wrong. That's not authentic. Um, and inherently, it might sell stuff, but it's not sustainable because eventually people realize that they can't get ripped in three seconds or whatever ridiculous claim people are making, and the product disappears. Like, good products have the products with longevity are the ones that do what they say they will because eventually the marketplace decides. You know, if someone makes a claim that's unsubstantiated, you know, people are going to realize it doesn't work, or some regulatory body is going to say, that's wrong. Here's a huge fine, and the company's going to go out of business. Same for you as a musician. I mean, you're not going to get sued, probably, but people are going to take you on your word. And if your word isn't what you say it is, then you know, like people value authenticity. It doesn't matter if you're a person or a, a business or a brand. That's something that I think is incredibly important to remember. I don't want to be the person that asks all the questions. I have so many questions to ask. <laughs> so give me a break before I ask the next question. Is there anything else you'd like to ask? Sorry, can I ask another one? Yeah. Um, do you think that persistence <clears throat> always helps? Um, I mean, is it, does it tend to be that people generally don't reply to emails sometimes because they're too busy and they're sometimes grateful to be reminded? Or do you think generally if they don't respond, it's very so not interested and they don't want to be hassled? That's a good, that's a very good point, and it's real hard to tell, isn't it? Because um, I've been on that side as well. When I, I freelance as a journalist, I'm pitching like editors and stuff, and sometimes I think, are they busy or are they pissed off? You can't tell. I honestly think that my, my approach to it would be persistence pays. Like, it's one of those things in life. People who persist succeed. Like, people who just give up just fail, because you're not going to generally get anything first time you try, whatever that is, whatever that applies to. So I think. Provided you're persistent, but you're, you're good about it. You're not just annoying. You're like, oh, hey, you know, I, I'm not sure how to kind of put this into words now. But you're, you're following up, and you're being helpful. You're not just like, why aren't you responding to me? What's wrong with you? You know, you, you are, you're coming back just, hey, I'm just reminding you about this thing that I sent you a few weeks ago. So yeah, persist I think persistence is the most important thing. Everyone is busy, whatever they do. But journalists may be slightly more busy than average because they get so many emails. Um, sometimes it's just maybe you want to try picking up the phone. People still call each other every now and then. Try that if you're not getting an email response. But again, try not to abuse that because people don't like being always hassled on the phone. It's just, it's one of those things it's hard to talk about because everyone's different. You just, I guess you just keep trying and you find, you, you'll find out like, I don't know how to say it exactly. Like some people will respond, and you'll work out what you did that was right that made them respond. Do more of that, and then you'll just continue improving your method and your message as you go along, if that makes sense. And I didn't write too much. I, th I think a lot of it comes down to frequency. I mean, I'm, I don't want to say that I'm getting that right all the time. I, I probably used to be really shit at it, but now I'm a little bit more persistent. So I send an email, and if I don't hear back. I send another email a week later, and maybe another one four or five days after that. And after three, four times, I would probably give up. But I have a bass player who recorded an album with me, who now does his own thing. He does like a 
jazz, funk, fusion, world, ethno thing, and he's very successful in doing that because he's the only one who does it. And he told me that his magic number for getting positive responses from promoters and companies and whatever is seven. seven. So that means he's fucking persistent. And it works for him. Numbers I don't know sales works as well. Yeah. Yeah, it's magic number for no, so it, it's, it's somehow he, he told me this only like a couple of months ago. It works for him. I mean, so far I'm, I'm I'm kind of doing like three or four. And somebody once also in who works in PR once said to me, "Well, if you don't follow up what you first sent, that is actually rude, because that person might have missed it, because they get 500 emails a day. If you don't follow up your own email, you're not being polite, because you're only giving them one chance to get you, to cut your email. Just a little thought." There is, there is actually something you can trick now. You know, I don't really like this culture. You know, on Facebook, you see, oh, this guy read that message that time. You know, why didn't he answer? <laughs> but now the same thing happens with with, with emails. There, there are there is some software. You know, yeah. Yesware. Mm. You know it? Yesware and, and signals from uh, HubSpot. You can actually track what people do on their emails. I do that all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I bet you do. <laughs> so, so if somebody opens the email but doesn't respond, I have an answer for that, you know, and I I, I change it a little bit. But do you, you have a shotgun as well, well and you know the address? <laughs> what that? Do you have a shotgun as well and you know the address? I know, I know where they are. <laughs> yeah, I'm an ex-military, so I send them a missile. <laughs> yeah, so uh, I think it's all about knowing how to respond and be flexible, but still sound like human. I think that's the most important thing. It, not, not to sound rude, you know, because even if you are persistent, if you're rude, nobody wants to answer to a rude person. I found out the, uh, just the past couple of weeks um, when I tried to book a little tour, and I, uh, so it's like a, a tour in coffee shops, so I played in seven coffee shops in seven days, and I wrote to many people for a month, I tried it, and then I started to uh, actually visit every single coffee shop catch the owner down and uh, in two weeks the tour was planned. So I, I reckon it's uh, we were so drowned in emails, mm. each of us and then people who <coughs> make decisions even more. So and just a personal contact is um, like going the extra mile now pays, pays, really pays off I think. Of course it's not always possible if you want to get to a guy in LA but it's far away. <laughs> but, but all this, this personal connection, like you, you're so much far ahead of everyone else who just sends emails. I, I don't know. You, know. you know what worked for me once? Um, so it, this magazine, it, it's a London-based magazine that is really nice. I've been reading it since I came to London, like a year ago. And I didn't want them to just receive an email and then open it, maybe open it or not. So I went there myself. Right, so it was a little office, two people inside, and I had a postcard, and I wrote personal invitation, and I gave it, you know, to them the hand by hand, and they said, "Wow, you're the first person that does that." <laughs> and, and I sat with them, you know, had tea with them, I talked with them. They asked me, "So what is it all about?" And I told them stuff that I would never have the chance to tell them by cold email. So I think sometimes, like being a human and, and trying to reach out to people in a creative way, something that <coughs> people don't do normally. It really pays off. Yeah. Yeah. By the way, they didn't, they didn't write anything about my show, but that's not No, but I agree with you. Um, I've seen some really kind of, um, like kind of ballsy ways of getting in touch with people, especially in like the CV world. You find people, like companies that really, say, have a huge demand for, um, there's a lot of people that want to get a certain job, and often it gets to the point where they get so many CVs sent to them that the ones that come in the most interesting packaging are the ones that make it to the top of the pile. Um, and people are still like, I guess now post is becoming a bit more of a novelty because you know it's free to do stuff via email. Everyone makes use of email. So if you can do a postcard that's a little bit different or you can send someone something tangible that they can hold in their hand, they'll remember that because that's becoming more and more unusual. So if you do have the money to do, you know, this small kind of, I guess, print run and then some, some postal marketing, you, you probably see uh, like as I say, you do, you, it's good to have the money in advance, but you'll probably see a much better result than just emailing people, because postcards are now a little bit different. You know, everyone gets email, but not all the time they get a postcard. But. Right.
So let, let's jump to another conversation because I, I was talking with a guy that is doing marketing for public stunts for big series, you know, when they want to break, they do a public stunt and they get publicity and people's attention and then they start with a conventional marketing. So I, I asked him, I want to reach out to this person that works for BBC. What, what should I do? Should I send them like a weird postcard or package, a black package or something? And he told me the best way to, to make sure that people will actually get back to you is to be introduced by another person they know or to find a connection with them and let the connection do the work for you. Because otherwise, you're doing really good marketing, but you're still doing marketing. Yeah. So you're in the right race. You might come first, but you're still around. Right. Yeah, yeah. That's a good point. I mean, that's how LinkedIn works. You, you any of you guys on LinkedIn, I'd imagine? You know, the idea of mutual contact. And it's, that's just, you know, it's, it's the most kind of, the easiest way to get, to make a new contact with someone and have them listen to you is to have someone vouch for you. Mm. So if you want to get in touch with a specific journalist or, you know, some tastemaker or like, not just a journalist, like anyone, you know, like a booking agent or someone in the music industry, like a promoter or a producer, probably you have someone mutual or if not like a second degree mutual. So someone who knows someone who knows them and go through that, you know, because they, 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 their credibility, the credibility of the person that you both know or the people that you both know carries over to you. And then you're not just some other name, like sending an email. You're actually that guy that, oh, Tom recommended. He's a really cool guy. And Tom's, I like what Tom has to say. Tom's smart. Um, so yeah, definitely introductions are just fantastic. And I've made so many, like most of my, I guess the people, the business contacts that have paid off for me commercially have been through introduction. It's not been through people who I've kind of pitched out of the blue and stuff. It's been through people who I know saying, Jack, can do this for you, talk to him. So, yeah, introductions, <coughs> recommend that. Anybody has a story about getting introduced to somebody? I have a little story. I know that somebody was coming, you talking about BBC, you know, uh, you could just stand outside the studio where they work with a little package, stalk them when they get there, you give them a package, say hello in a polite way, and off you go. Then order. No, 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 no. This, this, this actually has worked for people before. Um, I, I can't remember who it was, but uh, there, there are a couple of famous examples. But, uh, Elvis Costello did that. That's it. That's the one. That's 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 so Elvis Costello. Oh, yeah. Right. Okay. Oh no. He, yeah, he did the gig outside uh, in Soho Square. Some, something like that. Yeah, he rocked up. Gig, yeah. He rocked up in, in a truck and, and, and played on on the back of a truck, a bit like Paul McCartney does now. Not that Paul McCartney needs it, but. He did it in Covent Garden the other day. Yeah. But no, pack, just giving, yeah, giving a CD or something. Be aware of who's around you. I mean, I was in a pub in Paddington a few weeks ago. And Claire Matlock was sitting on the table opposite me. Luckily, I had a bag full of CDs, so I was able to plug at least one band with it. But he was dead chuffed, you know. But, but okay, so somebody's going out for a dinner. They know that they're famous people. So is it really nice to go and interrupt them just from their life? So. No, it's fine. This is always a question. For me, I, I prefer not to get in touch with them. Yeah. Maybe go in and give them a compliment. Oh, no, if it's been a dinner engrossing conversation, I wouldn't have bothered, but you've you got to go with gut feeling. And he was a really, really good guy. And so I go to the 12 Bar Club a lot as well, and you've got to be aware who's around you there. There's all sorts of people wandering there. And again, it wouldn't be over it. I wouldn't be intrusive. I totally agree with you with that, but sometimes it's just the right time, you know. Yeah, I, I guess if you don't try, you never know. You know, you, they might actually be the people that can help you. So. Well, most of the time, most of the people in the music industry are really nice people. Simple as that. But if they're at the theatre with their wife or something, then of course you don't. So. Okay, there's, I don't know, <laughs> I think we have to censor this thing in the video. So, yeah, there was actually a comedian that he said, all right, so there is this guy that comes to me and says, all right, I don't want to be an ass. I know you're busy, but please, I want an autograph. And the, guy, the comedian says, right, first of all, you're an ass. Go fucking away. <laughs> right? So I think it's, it's all about like knowing the right timing and not exactly, pissing yeah. people off. Right, creative people. We have a guy that knows shit, hell of stuff. Any questions, if you have them now, just take them out of the... 
for the box. Yeah, can I ask you, um, it seems like it's been largely started to do with press releases. Um, probably press releases you'd go to a journalist with. With the end game of getting a review, a review published somewhere, people will hopefully read the review. Even if they read it, they've still got to remember who you are by the time they've moved to the next web page or put the paper down or whatever. Um, it, it seems like that's quite the old school method of going about it that the labels used and have done for the last you know, 20, 30, 40 years, or whatever. Um, and I mean, I've been watching various presentations. Um, in fact, one of the recent ones was about how the sort of influence pyramid, if you like, has, has moved the other way around. And that we tend to listen to the people around us who are like us and make our connections and find interest in things that way around, rather than being told by people who are who would have been seen in the old days as the most important people to get on your side as an artist. It seems like that's turned around a little bit. So it, as far as press releases go, how do you think that is the way to go, to expend a lot of effort taking the copywriting rules that, and, and sort of theories that you've given us going for press releases, going for journalists, going for print, going for high profile blogs. It seems to me, I've had experience with this, that that uh, and allegedly sort of some success in getting the reviews is translated to nothing in terms of sort of long lasting raising of the profile or broadening of the fan base. Now they're great skills that you've given us. How do you think we could use those in a sort of more new, the inverted pyramid style that we have now. H how would you use your copywriting skills? I know you said I'm as an artist. Yeah, yeah, as I say, I, I, I don't, I'm not on this podium talking as an artist because I don't think I have anything commercially where I can say, I did this, it's amazing, you should do that. Um, but no, I totally agree with you. I think that like everything is going more to, you know, you, you have the, the word of mouth, the whole like you still have large publications and they still people still read them obviously but now you have more independent bloggers you have people listening to the recommendations of their friends and things like that so maybe maybe i i guess using press releases if it's really time consuming it takes you ages to do it maybe it's not worth it i mean i don't know what the hit rate is i've only been on the side that receives the press releases i've never been someone who's trying you know sending them out and that kind of thing so i couldn't really tell you how much it works but yeah, if I were in, I think if I were in your situation, or if I were an independent, if I was making more of an effort of being an independent artist, I would be reaching out to bloggers on Twitter and to people directly. Maybe your call to action, mm. which you should have in any piece of marketing work, should be, uh, as you've said, talking to the person, talking to the reader, but asking them to do something to spread your words. So So, uh, I mean, for me, I've not got a particularly big fan base. Uh, what I'd like is to broaden my fan base, and uh, the two big ones are Facebook and Twitter. But you have to make the connection, and you have to. All the, all the stuff you said quite near the beginning, I found really, really relevant. That you have to define who it is you're after, and then work out why they would give a shit about you. Um, how? I suppose that this is not about writing per se. How would you go about finding them and connecting with them using the theories that you gave us at <coughs> the beginning that doesn't get people on the wrong side by going, you know, retweet, retweet, you yeah. know, maybe from Adam, I'm great. Yeah. How, how would you go about Well, people, I guess the artists I've known who've made it work to some extent have used Facebook ads, to be honest with you. Because um, with Facebook ads, you can, and you can do this with Twitter as well, but you can. Say you're like an electronic, electronic artist and you sound a lot like Vangelis. You can, I'm not sure if you've done this before, but you can go on Facebook and you can get all the people who like Vangelis and you can send ads to them. Um, and that's just what they call segmentation. The idea is that you know, you're picking, you're defining a part of your target market based on 
a criteria that you think will make them like you. So if they like an iOS that sounds like this, you might like me. And then you know you would say you would post an ad to them saying, "Do you like?" And I've had this ad sent to me because I like Vangelis. Like, oh, if you like Vangelis, you'll like whoever this person is. And that's probably the only real music ads, the only kind of music ads I can remember. So that must mean that they count for something that I've actually been sent on Facebook that I clicked through because I thought, well, yeah, I do like Vangelis actually. Might as well see what this is about. In my mind. There's that thing where, well, I know that band's good, so I might as well give this one a try, as opposed to, I have no idea who this is, what's the point in even taking a punt, because there's so much music out there, I just feel overwhelmed. So yeah, I think it is about, for me, like if I were trying this, and maybe I'll give this a better go in a few months or something, but just finding out, using, like finding out your demographic by the music that they like, not by like maybe this is their background or any other attribute about them. But it could be different for anyone. Ideally, you like we get like a proper music marketer up here who could tell you who's done it on behalf of you know other bands and stuff. But that's what I'd do. So just a week ago, started to do exactly that targeted Facebook ads for. It's working a bit, um, but it, it's amazing the tiny tweaks that you can make that turn people off or turn people on to an ad. And I haven't really got my head round. What they are, yeah. I, mean, I, I did um, not to bang on too long about myself, but um, I started with a reasonably broad um, demographic, like people that like classic rock between the ages of 25 and 55, um, which gives you like 100,000 people or something. Put an ad up, got loads of click throughs, no conversions. I was having a, a squeeze page just to try and get email addresses out of people, give them a free download. Um, didn't didn't work. My headline was, uh, "Do you like Led Zeppelin or Deep Purple or something?" Exactly, exactly that. Comparing myself to somebody that people did know, uh, hopefully with a view to them going, "Oh, I'll give this guy a punt." Um, didn't really work. I changed it to "Classic Rock Fans!" Exclamation mark. And the exclamation mark people clicked through it like ten times. <laughs> yeah, that's it. And that's that's copywriting. That's about that. You change one thing in your headline, your response rate goes up like ridiculously. Oh, I, I, so that list that you were talking about, keywords and things that uh, just those little pressure points that seem to work for people would, would be sort of invaluable because you've got a 90 character, it's not even a tweet, you've got 90 characters to sell that tiny little ad in and make somebody click. And at the end of it, they have to be delivered something that they were expecting when they clicked on it, otherwise they click, oh I wasn't expecting that, uh, and then they're gone again. So it's, bru it's brutal. I'm, I'm finding that you know you can, unless you are really strict about your budget, you can just yeah. ca cane your daily budget without getting any sign up. Yeah, I mean that's it. Like same thing with the uh, Google AdSense, which is stuff that I guess I've been involved in. Um, it's the, the payment per click thing can ruin you if you're not careful. I mean it works, but it's like playing with it's that old cliche of playing with fire. Like it can work really well, or it can really not work well at all. Um, but like in terms of like your headline and stuff, what you're doing is good. Like so, the idea behind good copywriting is testing and measuring. So you have your new headline, which is converted say ten times better. That's now the one that you're going to use as a basis, and you want to improve upon that. You know, you you tweak a few things, and if it's better, the next one becomes your you know the one that you use as the test. We call that split testing A and B. So you know number A is the one that works. B is the one you want to work better, but you're not sure of, and and over time, if you keep changing and refining it, hopefully your headline gets better and your click-throughs improve. In terms of conversion, though, that's another thing entirely. That's how you've designed you know, your page. That, um, even that comes down to graphic design as well and like the sort of stuff you use there. It's a, it's a, a science, man. Like, it's, you know, there's people who are specifically headline writers and then people who specifically format pages to make people click through. Um, all I can say is that's great that you're doing that. Because most people will think about it and they won't do it because it's expensive stuff. Um, but it's it's an, a lesson that will cost you. Like you know, the, the, it could work in the long term, but you will have to pay money and time to get it to work. Um, but it's great that you're doing it because it does work. When it works, it really does work. Everything you said about copywriting and formatting um, and little bits that jump out would would directly relevant to. You know, what could worse, the squeeze page yeah. exactly as they were to a press release. So for me, that that's how I would probably apply your your sort of longer text 
thinking yeah. about you know, maybe this jump out call to action at the end I was yeah um, how do you well, one of the things that you said was how are you different and one of the things I, I had a trouble with and when I changed it on my page I got more sign ups was saying who I'm like actually not not who I'm not like um, musicians tend to be sort of very reticent about saying yeah I sound a bit like you know band A band B band C because you want to be you you don't want to be like somebody else yeah. Yeah. but if people don't know you they want to know kind of what they're getting and then you can tell them the idea that you're like that but a little bit different. Yeah yeah I guess that's how you're getting people in the door isn't it you're using that familiarity I'm a bit like Led Zeppelin but I do this um, so yeah I agree I think maybe when you're when you're attracting people initially you need like a, a heuristic a thing that they can simply think well I like Led Zeppelin so at least I'm gonna look at this and once you've got their eyes looking at you then you can go into a little bit more detail but again it's just like everything I say here it's just what I say. It all comes down to you trying it and improving it, seeing if it works for you or not. Because it's just you know that's it. That's the reality of the marketplace. It doesn't do what I says it. I say it won't. It should do. It does what it wants. And even the, the greatest expert in the world, who's definitely not me, can say one thing and find it. Especially at the speed that things change now, that it's wrong tomorrow. You know. So there are fundamentals, but. I think the uncertainty principle, don't be certain of anything, is probably the easiest. Just test everything you do. Um, it's probably a silly, silly question, but is there, you said about right time, is there a right time to send a press release? Because I know you can send it for different things, it could be a tour or yeah. a launch, but is there a, a right time also to approach journalists? Yes, there, there definitely are. Um, it's not specific for everybody, um, because everyone keeps a different schedule. but you'll find a lot of people are a hell of a lot more receptive to your messages on Friday afternoon than they are on Monday morning. Like literally, like they're just in a better mood. Think about it, the weekend's coming. Like on Monday, generally, people wake up and people have been emailing them like maybe over the weekend or, you know, just kind of, yeah, I guess over the weekend. So they've got this massive pile of stuff and they're like, oh, they're really tired. They've got all this stuff to do for the week. Delete, 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 delete. Come certain days of the week, as I say, like a simplification would be Friday afternoon. People are like, well, they're in a better mood, they've probably, probably got less on, so they're more likely to look at it. Um, end of the day is kind of good stuff as well, but you can get messages around 6, no, no 4.30, sometimes 5. That, that, that works for me, anyway, because those are the times where I'm kind of like winding down. I'm not so stressed out by all my work. Yeah, OK, um, follow on from email, what header would get you to open an email more so than another, what's an effect, you know, like an email title, what's the, you know what I mean? Bit. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah, uh, email, yeah. Um, I, things, uh, I guess, that's a hard one to answer, because it, it could depend on a lot of things, but um, something kind of like straightforward and something that looks like it was written for me, like, hello Jack, dot, 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 wanted to tell you about this, likely to be at least more interested by the fact that they referred to me by name and they thought I would be interested about something. That doesn't mean I'll, I'll look at the email and think they were like, but it's more likely that I'll, I'll open it. I mean, I try to, I try to open every email I get because I'm not like one of those guys who gets billions of emails. Like if, you, if you're talking to a staff writer at like The Guardian or something, like when I worked at FHM, my editor showed me his inbox and it was the most ridiculous thing I've ever seen. It was like 3,000 plus or something stupid amount of emails unread and he's like I really want to get back to all these people but I just can't the reality is I'm too busy um, so yeah you want to just you do want to get people to open that's that's a big thing getting people to open your email is step one and that's you know as I was saying that's where most of your effort should go into because if they don't open your email it doesn't matter what's in the email they're not going to read it but appeal to self-interest be informal I guess don't use capital letters, that sounds a bit ridiculous, but some American copywriters have it in their mind that if everything looks like you're shouting at people, they're gonna pay attention. In the UK, that doesn't work. We're much more reserved, you know. We don't like being shouted at through email. So, yeah, it's, it's very, it's person specific, but try and talk to them. You know, not, not just like a boilerplate thing. So like, my band does this um, tomorrow. Be like, hey, Tom, did you know, dot, 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 something like that. Which might be hard if you're emailing through a mail merge and you have like thousands of people you want to get in touch. How do you feel about people giving you a follow-up call 
Did you get my email? Yeah, that's, that depends on what's happening. Often I don't have time to take phone calls, but follow-up calls are fine. Just leave a message. A lot of people don't leave messages. I don't see the point of that. So like, oh, I'm going to try and call this person, get through to voicemail, don't leave a message. That's annoying. Because that's like, well, that's a call. Now I have to work out why they called me. I have to follow them up. But if someone has emailed me and they've been like, OK, couldn't get you, I sent you an email. My name is blah, blah, blah. I'm from blah, blah, blah. Thought you might be interested. Then eventually I'll get back to them when I get the time. So yeah, I think follow-up calls are good. It's, and it's different as well, because a lot of people don't do that. It's one thing that separates you from all the other people who are trying to get the attention of the writer. Good idea. I don't leave messages. Yeah, I leave a message. I'll just call you back when I can. Let's get back to it. I won't work with you. Uh, well, I guess we can't work together. I'll just wait for somebody <laughs> I can't work with. You know? Yeah, I, never, yeah. I never leave a message, never talk to a voice message. I'll just call you back in half an hour, an hour, or call you back tomorrow when I've got time. Okay. Eventually, you answer the phone, or I might send an email, or I'll send a you know, a text message. No, I didn't do that. I'll yeah. send an email, but I never leave a voice message. Well, maybe think about it now. No, I don't need to. I just move on. <laughs> I don't have to think about it now, I'd because I, I never leave messages either. I don't have to under voice. <laughs> if it's not important to answer the call, well, I just move on until somebody will answer the call. Well, yeah. That's one way. Is there an obvious way to track down uh, individual contact details for journalists at, say, a music magazine? It's one or two magazines I thought there's been particular people there from their columns that I thought it'd be good to send some stuff to them. But you know, sometimes they'll have like a reviews editor of details in the magazine, but often they don't. You've just got names. Yeah, yeah. And there are, there are, yeah. I, as, I, as I mentioned, there are resources like um, Gorkana, Entertainment for Media, uh, Darren Wilcox Publishing, where they have people who literally keep the databases updated, like they email on a regular basis to make sure that features editor is still features editor. Um, usually you pay for these services. Like I don't have access to them because I'm not PR. Um, but I know PR people who, like a couple of my friends are in the industry, and they're like, oh, you want, you want to get in touch with someone? Sure, let me just look them up. Um, so yeah, that is a possibility and if you want to talk about them. Yeah, yeah, I might be able to help. Yeah, yeah. I shouldn't do that too much, but <laughs> could help you out a bit, yeah. They are paid, yeah, yeah. I think like if you're an individual, you can get it relatively cheap, but um, mainly they're used by large PR agencies, so they have like a sliding scale on how much you pay. But they are good, they are up to date. It doesn't mean that like, um, you know, it's not like instantly people are gonna listen to you, but you'll know you're gonna get the right people, generally. Um, you said that you respond to emails where the header is kind of personal and it's clearly not all boilerplate. Um, the press release, itself that comes with the email because probably the press release isn't going to be the email you're going to you're going to write the email and say hi you read a couple of your reviews think you might like this because my band is similar blah, blah. the tone of the press release that you attach to it do you suggest having that in in, in a, a sort of personal tone or being the sort of standard i mean you, you know how they come across from PR agencies, you know, they, they big up the band, they're written in the third person, etc., etc. Or, or would you say maintain that more personal approach, or would you tailor that depending on the publication and the journalist that you're? Yeah, that's a great question. From my personal perspective, I'd rather read something that like reads like the per not third person, like first person. If the person wants to talk about themselves in the first person, to me that's great because often these things are third person things written by the person. No, yeah, yeah, the person writing about themselves in the third person, which I think is a bit redundant. So I like, why well, I hate writing biographies about myself. It's just silly. I want to be me. If I'm talking about me, it's me talking about me, not some imaginary floating word cloud that knows everything. So yeah, personally, I think that first person. But maybe people who are more used to more conservative might prefer the old approach of the kind of the third person hyperbolic big press release that seems to be doing the rounds and has been for you know, forever. So I don't know. I'd say first person for me, but I'd just ask a bunch of different people and see what they think. That's probably the best thing to do.
yeah. then peacefully I'd say, right, what I want. Okay, so that's like a headline. Right? So I'd choose like three to each really strong stuff. Yeah. First of all, they know who I am. So when they see my name, they know, right, I know this guy. And I met him like one day ago. And then I'd say what, what I want to get. Okay? And the first one is not substantive. I don't ask them for a reason either. It's just sort of like the shuffle. I ask them for something. I'll give them a compliment or whatever. So something really small or something that they don't even have to think after. So I establish the relationship to begin with. Because people are always responding to that, and I'm always trying to talk as I'm talking to a human person, like a human being, to a human being. <laughs> so, so, they, so they like that. I mean, if you talk like a robot, people think they speak like a human. So like, yeah. they just talk to me as if it's just a human, and you are speaking to them. Yeah, that's it. Good brain manufacturing. Yeah, I've, I've heard of that. Conversations on the web can are done are conducted with human voices. Okay? So we tend to forget that we, we sound like a voice in the audience when we talk. We need specific expressions and stuff. So this is all we have to do that. Yeah. And actually I want to share something. So I was trying to I was I was having that obsession myself. So I was trying to find what is the perfect email so people can click on the headline and then read the email and, and answer what I want what I want them to answer. So it was three paragraphs, like three sentences. So first of all, I'm going to write it here. So first of all, what I told you in the headline. So something that that people can realize when they know me from somewhere. Okay. So the first one, I mean, it was like hi, whatever. The first sentence is uh, you you trigger familiarity. So I try to make them realize, all right, how do I know you? Right. Number two, I, I make sure that they understand what I'm all about in the sentence. So they know that this is relevant to them and what I'm doing. So it's from me, and okay, so I'm, I'm just doing dark images for six months now, and we'll be happy in with a sentence, blah, blah, blah. All right, so they know that this, this is for them. So what I do, first of all, and number three, this is call to action. All right, so hello, professor, amazing professor X, blah, 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 this is how I know you. Number two, I've been doing dark images talks with topics that are related to your studies, for example, blah, blah, blah. And number three, I, I'm looking for a, for a speaker in three months from now, and you would be perfect to talk about this subject. Will you be, will you be up for it? And then, you go, whatever. And then at the end, this is the tip. At the end, so no links here. At the end, I write my name, under my name, my website. So if you want to know more about me, everybody clicks on it. If you want to know more about me, they click on the website. I didn't put it anywhere here in the link, and it wasn't implicit. It was just under my name. So if they read the whole thing, and they saw the link, they might click on it. So a name. And it works with everything. Personally, I've tried it. I've tried many combinations, and it does work. So you can try it for yourself. And yeah, and I'd, I'd completely agree with you. That's exactly the difference between and just one pitching. Not, not many yeah. Especially if they don't know you, they're going to take time to read. That's the difference between just being like, do this, being you know hard sell and just pitching someone, and actually coming to them and being like, here's the thing, you know, like talking to them as a person. Um, and that's what I try and do as well. Like you know, if I want to get to know someone first, I speak to them on Twitter, so we have a connection. Even though if I can't see them in the real world, and then in the email I'll say, hey, we spoke on Twitter, dot dot dot, and then I'll refer to what we spoke about. So that's, yeah, that's exactly what I do. And I, it does work, definitely. This familiarity is the main thing. So yeah, if you're not on Twitter, um, you maybe have your reasons for not using it. But personally, 
I recommend. It's one of the very easiest ways to find the people that you want to get in touch with and just reach out to them and have a little bit of familiarity before you take things a little bit more seriously to email or whatever. But I know some people I prefer not to use it, and that's fine. <coughs> but easier with Twitter than, like, I guess, Facebook or that kind of thing, because adding people, it's probably not something that you guys do, but, you know, just messaging people on Facebook, adding people on Facebook or some of the other forms of social media, it's, it's not quite the same. The, the conventions are different. You know, the, the following, you can't follow strangers in the real world without getting arrested, but you can on Twitter. <laughs> so use it. How do we get the, uh, the press uh, template, press release template? Um, well, I've got, like, I've got it as a PDF, so my plan was to just give it to Tommy, and he will make it available to you guys. It'll be on the, the website with all the resources and everything else, and the video, the, the timeline, the tweets and stuff, it's going to be all there. So. Yeah. This website is growing into a monster. <laughs> my website? <laughs> yeah, I think I need to buy a better server now. Yeah. Which is good. It's alright. Good monster. Uh, I mean, if it's a monster that helps people yeah. understand things, then that's, that's great. I think it's fantastic. Right, cheers. But it will be a monster. <laughs> <laughs> right. Any other crucial question you want to address now? I know who you are. I know who has questions, but they're shy. <laughs> Go for it. He, he notes down points later on. Okay. <laughs> I know that a few people in here, after a few beers, they're going to start asking questions, so <laughs> just throw it out there. It's, it's not a big thing, like, as I say, if you want to talk to me later on, um, you'll have my details. I'm happy to answer any other questions that you might have now that you don't want to ask or things that come to you later on. Here's a help, basically. Yeah, I could have used this evening, about four or five, six weeks ago, because I sent a press release over the last few weeks. So apart from the timing, I'm, I'm, I, I haven't got much criticism. <laughs> but your timing is it's just too late. <laughs> but thanks. Right. So should we close this conversation? Or is there anything else? Can I just say, your, your email, I don't know if anyone else got it, I don't open all your emails, I'll be honest, but I do open most of them, especially the sex one. <laughs> it said sex, and I was just like, right, what is it? You, you know, now, you know, now we know what you're interested in. You, you know, you know what? It, yeah, I'm just saying, I was just shocked, because he, he put that, I saw that it was him. Like, oh. Didn't even read the rest, I was just like, no. Right, easy, easy. So, so that was an email where I wrote, sex, exclamation mark, and then what I wanted to. Yeah. Do you have any questions about copywriting? <laughs> yeah. So this, this is something quite tricky, but yeah. I mean, I I want to do I didn't want to do I want to didn't want to do that once. Tell me, I didn't open it. You didn't see it. You didn't <laughs> I saw it. Right. I saw it. <laughs> no, I haven't opened it yet. <laughs> so it didn't work on me. <laughs> you know, we know what kind of person you are. <laughs> right. Okay. So so yeah. I guess if anybody has any questions later. Yeah. We, we can get in touch with you yeah, on, yeah. on Twitter. I'm going to put everything on the email anyway, so when they go home, they can have all the con contact details on their email. Um, right, okay, so first of all, I would like to, to thank London Fusion. Um, would you like to say a few things about that? No. Right, okay, so basically, um, yeah, we'd like to thank, to thank London Fusion for this amazing place, right? So they're our partners, uh, and they provide all the drinks you had, and this amazing space, inspirational space, and uh, all the equipment. So yeah, I would like to thank them. Uh, obviously, I will send you a link as well so you can see what they do, if this might be interesting, interesting for you. Um, and something else, I think today we're gonna start doing something, something new. Um, so I realize that many people here have personal stories that we'd like to share, right? <coughs> so uh, I just wanna give like a go to a few artists that will say, some of their personal um, experiences and what would they believe, perceptions about the industry, what they did, what worked, what didn't. So something that we're more familiar with, artists, right? So today we have uh, Carl, you want to still want to yeah, talk? Yeah, of course. All right, so yeah, we just but, but see what Carl has to say about... One second. One second. Maybe, maybe a little applause from the speaker. Oh yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah.